culture and education. This international festival is promoted by the Department of Culture of Paraná State, the Municipal Department of Culture, the State University of Londrina, and its Casa de Cultura, and also by the Association of Friends of the International Music Festival. The first international symposium of music education starts now about the theme, the diversity of epistemological roots in music education. PhD researchers and professors from all continents will be sharing their knowledge with us in the aim of stimulating the debate around the role of musical education in human development in the exercise of full citizenship, as well as in human rights. Discussing about diversity is a political, aesthetic, and ethical act. This initiative aims to value all kinds of knowledge existing in the world, in addition to being an important paradigm so that we can praise those symbolic riches which are part of the history of humanity. The first international symposium of music education has the valuable support of International Society of Music Education, Brazilian Association of Music Education, State University of Londrina, Federal University of Goiás. Let's proceed now to the opening of this event. I will give floor to the executive committee composed by the professors. Flavia Cruvinel from the Federal University of Goiás. Sandra Oberoi from the International Society of Musical Education. And Magali Kleber, pedagogical director of this international festival. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. It's a great to me to participate for the first international symposium of music education carried out by the International Music of Londrina with support of the Special Secretary of Culture, Minister of Tourism, and the Brazilian Federal Government as a representing the Federal University of Goiás. I would like to thank you for inviting me to collaborate, Professor Magali Kleber and Sandra Oberoi, my colleague of the Board of ISNI, International Society for Music Education. I emphasize the important importance of having us here today. Celebrating music education is a all of your diversity, share ideas, experience, researches in a dialogical perspective, assuming the promotion of music education as a primordial part of human being formation and one of on the ways of transform, social transformation and justice. The theme of the seminar is diversity of epistemological roots in the music education, invite us to review, to renew our training models in music and seek to broaden our views and practice based on dialogue with other cultures, realities, and bases. Future as a symbolic territory of disputes and representation, the representations has a complex structure of the fields for production and work. And in this sense, the, professionalize, the professionalizations of musicians, artists, and cultural works constitutes a arduous struggle for recognizing the sector of social and economic lives, as well as culture as a right and part of the lot of importance uh, public goods for develop, development to any of any society. In Brazil, culture is still outside for the centralities of debates, both in the government spheres and the scope of university. 
the debate about the centrality of culture and music education as a field of production and knowledge practice and is essential of the, to the society, we only have effect based on the collaborative work in this network that articulates music educators, institutions, social movements, cultures, producers, and students and general publics in a participatory process of collective construction of structuring the base for formulates a cultural policies that include the music education. In this sense, this event brings at this network of institutions such as ISMI, ABEN, State University of Londrina, Federal University of Goiás, and others, uh, which engage to the in the process of creating strategies to strengthen new uh, networking in favor of music education from various, par various parts of the world, have a premises that the participation and representativeness of uh, regions and part of the, the world. So that music education contribute, contribute I, I think, and I defend, and we defend, that the music education contributes to human, the ethical, and aesthetic, of aesthetic, aesthetic formations commitment to development of our the process and more uh, democracy and and work of collaborating society and to be uh, the barrel world once again i thank to magali and sandra for the partnership invitation and i wish everyone a great seminar thank you Greetings to one and all. We are so happy that you decided to join us today. I'm going to say good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, for some of you, it's night, I know, but whatever the time, isn't it lovely that we can all come here together and enjoy this time talking about music education in Brazil? When I think of this journey of how this symposium came into being, I cannot stop but simply wonder and even marvel at the power of persistence and the magic that unfolds when we combine our efforts, working together with a singular purpose in mind, that is supporting and promoting quality music making experiences for all. It was in early May 2020 that as part of the International Society for Music Education, our advocacy work, that I reached out to Dr. Magali Kleber. We had a deep and a very fruitful discussion about the possibility of a special event that could potentially change the way we approach music education in Brazil. Following that, Professor Magali Kleber and Professor Flavia and I, we met together and I cannot say how happy I am today, how happy we are today that this is a culmination of those initial discussions. Can you believe it? I don't want you all to give up on the thoughts and the hopes that you have, that you're bringing here today. Don't give up because change is inevitable. We can safely say, like I said, that today is a culmination of those, of that little spark those synergistic ideas and the heart and shared vision that ISME has with all our partnering associations in Brazil. Over the next two days, we will be able to hear 
about interesting projects, key research act activities and initiatives that have positively impacted our international communities. We invite you all to ask questions and have an open dialogue about what matters to you. The ideas that you bring are all missing pieces of a big puzzle, a grand puzzle. Your wisdom and the ideas that you bring, the collective energy will be invaluable and very useful as we work over these next two days in restructuring and rewriting some of the pertinent policies that shape music education in Brazil. We are very grateful for the support of all our partner associations, especially I am truly amazed how Professor Magali has been the backbone getting together all of this with the great support of Professor Flavia. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to the government as well, our government officials, our organizations, without which we cannot be here and we can't do what we are doing. And especially a huge thank you to all our colleagues from ISME, including our special, special dear president of ISME, Professor Emily Akuno, who you will hear shortly. Thank you, because everybody's time is precious and they have made time to be here for change in Brazil. I'm so excited about this and I hope you are as excited as we are. Have a wonderful seminar these next two days. Thank you so much, Sandra and Flavia, for your kind words. It's wonderful to hear this message. It's important for me as chair. And good afternoon, good night, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of the Londrina International Music Festival, and on behalf of the Executive Committee, I would like to welcome everyone. We have 390 registration in this, this symposium from all over the world, and we celebrate your presence here with us. Our vision recognizes the importance of music practice as an identity axis, and we aim to expand aesthetic frontiers with no hierarchy. We have the opportunity to share the work and the experiences of researchers from several countries like Kenya, USA, India, Hong Kong, South Africa, Nigeria, and as well from some of the most relevant researchers from Brazilian universities. This will be a deep dive into multicultural reflections. We will have the opportunity to share our reflections and deepen our comprehension of the symposium theme throughout the sessions. And I would like to highlight two words that are core foundations of this symposium, roots and diversity. When I say roots, I mean it in the sense of the immutable nature of the object. It is the basic, the principle, the origin. In its figurative sense, roots, it's a word that transmutes itself in the emotional feeling between someone in their place of birth, their culture, their values. We are talking about survival, the necessity of nurturing it, and providing a favorable environment for its flourishing. Diverse, as we have been discussing for a while now, 
can be discussed taking into consideration the multiplicity of contexts. As we know, the UNESCO Convention on Cultural Diversity was approved in 2005 with the main objective to, one, create an international legal instrument to protect and to promote cultural diversity. Two, to create the conditions for cultures to flourish and to freely interact in mutually, mutually beneficial manner in the face of the pressures from globalization and international trade policy. And three, to encourage dialogue among cultures with a view to ensuring wider and balanced cultural exchanges in the world in favor of intercultural respect and a culture, a culture of peace. So the two conceptions, roots and diversity, in deepest sense are the background to discuss about epistemology on music education. We need to find a way to understand how the knowledge is structured, take into consideration the multi-dimension aspects of several groups in this planet. In this symposium, we constitute a great international community that has the potential to point out a consistent direction and purpose to inclusive music education. And that is why I would like to thank all professors participating in this scheduled six session, bring their personal experience in research and social action. Thank you so much for your important presence and participation. I also would like to thank the International Society for Music Education in the presence of its president, Dr. Emily Acuno, and Sandro Beroy, Chair of Policy and Advocacy Commission, for their generosity in contributing to structure this symposium in its form and content. Last but, but not least, I would like to thank our amazing team of staff for making this event reality. I believe we have formed a potent international commit with co community with a mission to make inclusive music education a reality. So we can celebrate the multiplicity of teaching and learning methodologies without discrimination and without hierarchy. It is great to be able to celebrate our roots in this extraordinary world of diverse and multiculturalism. It's my pleasure to announce that doors are now open to the first international symposium of music education at Londrina International Music Festival. Thank you very much. We thank you, professors, for the brilliant, encouraging, and joyful opening speech. And also, I have a note for our audience. If you have questions, please write them on the chat. Our team is going to organize and send them to whom it may concern. We shall start the first conference. The theme is a visible voice. What does this theme mean for Brazil? With Professor Emily Acuno, President of International Society of Musical Education. To mediate this conference, we are glad to invite professors Alda Oliveira and Liane Hentke. Hello. Fala para Liane. Okay, hello everyone. 
is yes we are here hello everyone i'm professor liani henschke and we'll present our guests today but before i would like to thank dr Magali kleber dr flavio oliveira and their team for organizing this international symposium named visible voices it is my honor to introduce this uh, keynote speaker, Professor Emily Acuno, who at the end will take uh, questions from Dr. Alba Oliveira and myself. Welcome with all the honors uh, to this Brazilian seminar, uh, Dr. Emily Acuno. Uh, Professor Oliveira would like to say some words. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone in Brazil. Thank you, Magali, for the invitation. Thank you, Emily Acuno and Liane Henschke for sharing with me this outstanding seminar. Okay. Thank you, um, Professor Oliveira. I, um, Dr. Uh, Professor Acuno has an extensive CV and uh, here I'm going to just highlight the most important at this moment. So Professor Acuno is Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the Cooperative University of Kenya. Trained as a performer educator, Professor Acuno is actively involved in the music and music education scene in Kenya and internationally. She was president of the International Music Council, and now she is the ESM president. Welcome to this symposium. We have reserved 20 minutes uh, for you, and 10 minutes for Alba, and 10 minutes for myself to exchange ideas with Dr. Kuno. The floor is yours, Emily. Thank you so much, Liane. It's, it's so good to see you again. I feel as if we're in the same room, though I'm in Africa, and you're on the other side of the world. Alda, it's good to be with you. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been such a beautiful pleasure listening to Flavia, Sandra, and Magali. It, it is always lovely hearing people talk about music education and people who are so passionate about music education and people who from where i sit actually speak what they do it is exciting i am glad to be here with you allow me to share my screen because 20 minutes have a habit of running very fast okay. uh, this will help me I think I did the wrong one. Which one should I do? Okay, let's try that. Yes, this will help me be um, stay in context. I'll talk about cultural diversity and music education. My way of uh, reorganizing the, you know, the the topic, the the whole thought behind uh, what this symposium is about. I start by saying thank you, a very big thank you to all the Brazilian friends and organizers of this first international seminar. It's, it's, it's courage. I heard you speak, speak of her courage. I heard you speak of resilience. What a joy. And, and I believe when you see something that you have dreamed about and, and planned for, you know, get started, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief, and I'd like to say congratulations. I am so grateful for the partnerships and networks between friends and then between institutions. You know, institutions don't move, but humans do. So it starts with friends who come from different institutions, and they come together, and they bring things um, that are meaningful. And on that note, I'm very grateful for the partnerships that we have at ISME with the various teams or with the various associations in Brazil. And then, thank you so much for being our friend. I'd like to thank Liane and Alda for letting me share this space. These are people whom I respect a lot in the world of music education. And it is good to be able to be here with you. But 
all those music educators and researchers and practitioners who started before we did, you know, they, they gave us some procedures, they gave us some vocabulary that we can use to perhaps clarify issues. And uh, they have also perhaps, um, um, shall I say, um, muddied the waters, you know, they raised issues that now give us important topics to go and research on. Had it not been for people who went earlier than us, we probably wouldn't know what to do. So I'd like to thank all the researchers ahead of us. What am I going to talk about? Yeah, that is now gone. Um, music education. Just, just briefly, you know, this is by way of preamble. I consider music education as a human engagement, and it is designed. It is designed to serve and to meet the needs of human beings. And where does it come from if it is being designed? There are perceptions, there are aspirations, and there are situations that the human beings find themselves in. And I get the impression that Brazil finds itself in a specific space. The music educators have ideas. There's, there are ways that they see things. They have hopes and they find themselves in a space where perhaps things are not going the way they would like for it to go. And so they design certain things or certain uh, programs around music. But I also find music education as a humanizing agent because music involves people, people who come together to engage on a shared platform, people who have or who use common resources, but the results are diverse because there are different outcomes and different outputs depending on where we began, depending on the thoughts that we had in mind as we began. And thus the diversities. There are diverse products of the various modes of seeing things, the various modes of validating the phenomenon that we loosely refer to as music. And I say, you know, seriously, that we loosely refer to something as music. And I mentioned that a little, a little later. And because there are diverse things, there, there are diverse ways of considering music, there must be diverse ways of handling or of engaging in music education. But the foundations of these diverse music education trends result in diverse notions of what music is, of what music education is, of what music and music education do, and of what music and music education achieve. And these include who the players in music and music education would be. I mentioned that I'd, I'd, I'd just say something briefly about Isne, and we're talking about a visible voice. How do we get Brazil's voice to be visible in the music education arena, in the global arena? And perhaps, is it necessary? And I'll speak about Isme's values because in those values, I find the modalities, I find the rationale, and I find the authority, if I may say that, for engaging with different people and encouraging them to make their voices visible. The first of our values is networking. And what we have, what we're seeing right now is an outcome of networking. What do we do when we network? We are just coming together, bringing people, reaching out to different people, reaching out to different organizations so that we can work together towards what? Our second value, intercultural and international understanding and collaboration. We never succeed when we are alone. And for our voices to be visible, for us to enable somebody else's voice to be visible, we need to appreciate that they may be different from us. They may 
and that is culturally, they may be in a different location from us, but we need to understand, we need to appreciate, we need to honor, we need to respect their ways, their traditions, their methods. And then, where possible, and I think most of, most of the times it is possible, we find ways of working with them because we have a common goal, enabling or enhancing music education. And then we have advocacy. I was so thrilled to hear Sandra's um, uh, speech just now, as she mentioned um, the activities that started uh, mid-2020. Mid and that is advocacy. What do we want around advocacy? For me, it is really simply to make each person's voice audible or visible. That you, as a music educator, you enable the people around you to have access to music education. That music education should be available to everybody everywhere. That those are the three strong values that we stand for. And so we have used these to build a six year strategic plan. And out of that six year strategic plan, I have carved out, we have carved out for these first two years of those six years of that strategic plan, the uh, buzzword, a visible voice. It sounds wrong and it is very correct because the visibility of the music educator, educator needs to be seen. Where is it seen first? In the quality of your work, in the quality of your output. And what are we doing about it at ISNI? We're engaging in professional development of members, and we've tried a couple of things, and I think we are getting to a point where we can roll out a program of professional development. And I want to thank again ISME board members who have put so much effort in this. But the visibility of our voice also speaks to representation. Representation of the different cultures and communities that the members of ISME come from. And this is very clearly articulated, especially in the guidelines when we come up with our committees and when we come up perhaps with our commissions that we have tried to make sure that there is regional representation in the various committees. I'll give an example. I want to believe that Flavia from Brazil is a member of the ISME membership committee. And Sandra, uh, coming to us originally from India, is the chair of ISME's advocacy committee. So we try to be inclusive, that is one, and that is coming next. But we also try to make sure that the voices that are heard within the decision-making organs of ISME represent the people who are members of ISME. Then I've just talked about inclusion. Inclusion in terms of the content of what ISME engages in. We have commissions and we have special interest groups that focus on different areas or different components of this global event that is called music education. You know, I could talk about ISME until forever. So let me leave that for the time being. Let's talk about this cultural diverse, oops, that's a wrong spelling. Pardon me, diversity, the I comes after the ends, my apologies. And, and uh, really what, I, what I'm um, engaging in now is just talking about cultural diversity and music education. Where is the diversity felt or seen? Where is it visible? And when we talk about music and music education, what are these diverse roots, cultural roots, that impact on, or that spell out what music education is. I think the first area of the diversity is in the concept of music. You know, what I call music may not necessarily be what you call music. And yet, I still need to respect your music. That is the first instance. But the other instance, um, the other element is the processes of music, and that's the processes of music education. 
and these processes, you know, within our music, the music, um, there are concepts, their skills, and their attitudes that we develop through music education and through the process of teaching and learning that music. What skills are these? We develop skills in the course of engaging with the sound phenomenon that we call music. Skills for perceiving music, that is analytical skills, and skills for discrimination, for distinguishing between one and another. We also develop skills for manipulating music, the performance skills. How about skills for translating the symbols that are used to represent music into sound. And these are diverse because of the concept that we have of music. Part of the processes for me are now the processes of teaching music. And for, a long, for some of us, teaching is, or learning is doing alongside somebody who knows. So you pick from them. I remember in two places where I have taught, our colleagues were, you know, they had difficulty distinguishing between students and the faculty, simply because when we have practical work, sometimes you cannot tell who the student is and who the lecturer is, because the students learned by playing alongside ourselves as the lecturer. There is diversity in the processes of music and the processes of music education because of the cultural context, the cultural understanding of what music is. But I think one other area of diversity uh, is, is in the planning, and that is important. I think for you in Brazil, what I hear is that is a crucial issue to think about. When we're talking about planning, we're talking about policy, aren't we? And I think for as long as anybody appreciates music as a medium of expression, as a language, then they will want to consider music as part of the young people's development. There is also the positioning of music, and I'm really keen on this right now. My take is that music literacy or arts literacy is a basic literacy, very much like numeracy, very much like language, because it facilitates cultural intelligence, the ability to um, function effectively in a space of cultural diversity. So it, it, it relates to, it, it enables us, enables us to um, relate to people with different, uh, from different uh, cultural orientations. It also helps us to understand different cultures. And I think the understanding and, and positive relations are better than cultural to tolerance because music is a socializing agents, agent. So the concept of music, the process of music, the planning of music, these are diverse. And, and I, I'd like to point out my perception that all music is tied to a community's worldview. So music education, the concept, the process, and the planning of, of, for music education are going to depend on what the people believe. If they believe that music fits within their philosophy, their concept of the nation, then they will be able to justify the place of music in education or in the place of music in the development of the people of the nation. And one does not always need long you know, papers justifying the place of music. I think it comes from a deep conviction that society is important, the community is important, and music plays a significant role in building that society, building that community. And I want to move to Kenya. In Kenya, in our constitution, it is clearly stated that culture is the foundation of our constitution. And that means that cultural expressions are expected to stem from that notion. And therefore, education planners really need to grasp that as something to help us along. So what is 
music education like, especially in Kenya? What's the field of music education? What does it look like? There are multiple players. And there are initiatives that come. Some of them are commercial. Others are people who actually see a need, a gap, that perhaps government has not provided. And so they decide that they're going to fill that void. And I think that is important because, and I have learned, like for us in a developing country, government is not always able to provide what it is that we want. So there are different types of music schools or, or individuals who are offering music programs. So there are many different players. There are also um, multiple foundations of music education. What are these foundations? Whether it is formal, you know, very, very formal, like school-based, or some that are quasi-formal. I, I, I shy away from the word informal because the way it has been used of, uh, in some places for me um, kind of downplayed the, the very clear procedures, processes that are involved in the teaching of music, especially the indigenous methods. So I will talk about formal and, and maybe not that formal because they may not be, um, the, the time may not be that restricted. These are the multiple, some of the multiple foundations that um, spell out what music education is. And it's not just in Kenya. I know it is worldwide. There are countries that are coming up with new education policies. I am aware that there have been countries that have been working on education uh, policy reviews. And, and we see that in news, we see that in social media when people who are involved are, are critiquing or, or making certain comments about it. Um, in Kenya, we are rolling out a competency-based curriculum where there are distinctions between the STEM subjects, the humanities and social sciences, and then we have carved out this area that we're calling arts and sports. And somehow it is expected that at least for the first five years of education, all the learners will engage practically in music competency development. Let me come to an end. The cultural diversity. What do I see? That the notion of music has cultural roots and connotations. There is a space that music occupies in the existence of humans, therefore in articulating their culture. And therefore, because music is so cultural, then culture really is at the heart of music education. Culture is a strong root of music education. The epistemology, the methods, the scope, the rationale, the beliefs, etc., about music education hinge on the people's culture, the people's worldview, the people's way of perceiving themselves, the people's aspirations. And I hear certain aspirations from the team that we have here. So what we do, how we do it, and why we do it in the name of music education are really cultural statements. So the nations, several nations have many cultural groups within them. And they would therefore have diverse roots of music education especially if you take my um, notion that culture is a strong root of music education. So, however, there are certain commonalities, and I think one of the common things that they hold is that music is an agent of socialization. Therefore, music education is a way of socializing people. Each culture has its values, and these values are expressed and demonstrated in the daily engagements, the relationships, and the conversations that we have amongst ourselves. Music is a catalyst for these negotiations. And I think music education, therefore, needs to be part of a people's engagement because it facilitates these conversations, it facilitates relationships, and it, has, it facilitates cultural co collaboration and engagement, because out of this, we can have an enlightened and a sensitive society. Thank you so much. I have a feeling it took more than 20 minutes. We talk regarding.
that is the end of what I would want to say. Let me hand back to Liani. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Professor, for your talk. Uh, I think it's very important to us, also relating what uh, in Kenya is happening and in Brazil, it's uh, not much different in many ways. But thank you very much. Very enlightening. Now, Professor Kuno will take questions from Professor Alda Oliveira. But first, a quick introduction. Uh, Professor Oliveira also has an extensive CV, and uh, we have just time to say some words here. Uh, she was a former professor of music education at the Federal University of Bahia, honorary life member of ISMI. She took the first Brazilians to participate at ISMI conferences, introducing the society for many music educators in Brazil. She is a pianist, a music educator, and composer with many publications. Also, she was the founder of ABEM, the Brazilian Association of Music Education, and board member of ANPOM, the Brazilian Association for Research and Graduate Studies in Music. Professor Oliveira, the floor is yours. Muted? Unmute. Sorry. Okay. Is okay? Yes. 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 Dear Emily Acuno. I liked very, very much your speech. I remember when I visited three times Africa, South Africa, and uh, I had great moments, but I'm not, I'm not like uh, taking time to speak about that. Uh, since you are discussing visible voice, I would like to ask you the two questions. Considering the pandemic, how can the new technological and pedagogical uh, posture articulate with or connect to human actions? How is this positioning itself with this situation? This is the first question. The second question is, how is me works on the visibility of its member countries? The word is with you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Now, wow, trust Alda to ask such a tough question. <laughs> but fortunately, there is experience that can help us to um, just address the questions. For starters, technology. I always consider technology as a tool, a tool that helps me to negotiate barriers that I might have, a tool that enables me to be a little more efficient in what I have or in what I'm trying to do. And this past year, we have seen that technology is a very good tool. You know, we, we have used technology. Last year, we were supposed to go, as ISME was supposed to go to Helsinki, and COVID said no. But we were still able to engage in scientific academic activities thanks to technology because we could connect. So ICT, the internet, an enabler, and ISME is using that quite a lot. In fact, all our board meetings are held online. So ISME is going on despite the pandemic. We, could, we cannot travel. Even this, even this, I'm not in Brazil, but you are not going on. I mean, thank God for that. But the other avenue of, of, um, of, of technology being useful, and this is something that I've been reading, I've been following up, many of our music classes could not take off. Immediately the pandemic came and schools closed and ETC, the private teachers, the studio teachers, things were not happening. But thanks to technology and Zoom and WhatsApp, I think most people started on WhatsApp, then moved to Microsoft Teams and moved to Zoom. Lessons took off. It, it is not the same as face-to-face, -face, you know? And, and I have tried teaching voice on Zoom and 
it gets to a point there's certain sounds that just cannot come through. I have one student whose voice it disappears in the Zoom. I can't hear it. But I can watch her. I can see her posture. I can see that she's doing the correct things. And when she records it and sends it to me, I can hear. So there we are. So, so the, the different um, uh, technology is making things accessible for us. And at ISME, that is, is working for us very well. Again, um, they say the, the world has become a global village. And that means that we can transport our music works. And technology has been very valuable for us in, first of all, assisting us in creating our work because of the immediate response. You can hear if, if uh, the sound that you've just put in is not what you wanted, you can come back and correct it, but also packaging it and then disseminating it and storing it. And so that, that is how it is making, for me, that is how it is making our work a little more efficient. But you know, um, I usually tell people that I come from Africa and in Africa, things don't happen, things are done. The technology is not going to happen on its own. You must have a plan in your mind. You must know what it is that you want to do and then select the appropriate technology that is going to facilitate that for you. How is ISME positioning? No, no, there's also the pedagogical posture. Hmm. Something that is coming out very strongly and it is something that I'm seeing is that we are leaning a lot towards learning by doing and doing with others. <laughs> and doing with others who know. I'm actually speaking my mother tongue in English. So um, I hope my expressions are, are clear. So, so we, we are learning together. And even in the pandemic season, we are still finding ways of collaborating and learning. We are negotiating the learning space. And, and it turns out that sometimes um, there, is, there is what the teacher brings into the class. There's also what the learner brings into the class. There's a kind of exchange a negotiation so that the outcome is acceptable to the student. That almost sounds wrong, but it meets the objectives of teaching and learning. How is ISME positioning itself? How do we connect this to the human action? I just mentioned that things don't happen, but there is also the focus of music education. What are the aims? What are the principles? What are the philosophies? They need to be, shall I say, humane? We need to be working towards a holistic development of the human being. Ismail's positioning itself is in that, the threefold value statement that I mentioned a little earlier, the networking, the internationalization, and the advocacy. And we, are thinking of, we have this worldwide community of music educators. Technology is allowing us to connect to one another. Internationalization, the different pedagogies, music education pedagogies from the different cultures are kind of meeting in one place and, and they rub shoulders and we learn from one another. And that allows us to understand ourselves from a cultural perspective. In terms of uh, advocacy, music education for all, despite their ages throughout the world, again, and technology then allows us to make this make this possible for those who can access the technology. Um, through the strategic plan, uh, as we are focusing on a visible voice, we aim at enhancing the visibility of the diverse contexts, contents, concepts, processes, materials, outputs, and outcomes of education. And thanks to technology, thanks to the diverse pedagogical orientations, this is possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emily. Thank I you. liked very much your answers. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Acuno and Professor Oliveira. Uh, now I think it's my turn. 
I so, sorry, sorry, Liane, there was a question on um, the visibility of member countries. Now, when once we got onto the new uh, constitution, membership at ISME is now individual. You are an individual member or you're a partner. So the notion for me is not the member countries, but perhaps the countries from where the members come. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just twisting that a little. And this year um, in the regional conferences, we have started, um, we had some three opportunities to engage the members in professional development based on the needs that they expressed. So that is a way in which we want to try and make the voices of our individual members visible. Thank you. Thanks, sorry, Leanne. I needed to respond to that. Yeah, okay. that's, uh, that's fine. You. So I briefly will introduce myself. I'm a former uh, professor of uh, music education uh, at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, Porto Alegre in Brazil. I was a president of ISMI International uh, Society of Music Education between 2006 and 2008. And uh, nowadays I'm also honorary life member of ISMI. Uh, I was vice president of the International Music Council between 2009 and 2010. And in two, uh, 2014, I shared the first uh, conference, uh, ISME conference in Brazil. It was the 31st ISME World Conference in Porto Alegre, Brazil. All right. So, um, Professor Acuno, uh, very nice hearing to you. I'm, I'm learning a lot. And uh, so I will pose two uh, quick questions. Uh, first of all, how cultural diversity in music education can be worked nowadays after years of globalization and massification of some cultures through the existing technology of communication? Diversity, I'll, I'll look at it in two ways. One might be kind of negative, especially in relation to technology, when some have and some don't have. When some technologies are very complex and perhaps could be very efficient and others are not as complex. And when our own um, um, tech savviness, you know, there's that, there's that diversity. And when some of us actually fear technology and others thrive on technology, this really affects what we do and how we do things. For example, those who have internet connectivity and those who have the ICT devices uh, manage 2020, 2021 very differently from those who, who did not. So that, that, is, that is perhaps not so positive a way of looking at the diversity, but the diversity still exists. But um, despite globalization, or shall I say, thanks to globalization, the issue of identity is coming up. It sounds like for those who are involved in music and music education, for those who are involved in, in, in the culture industry, as broadly uh, to put it, are not so keen of getting lost in the mass. They want to retain who they are. And this of course is, is tied to our perception of our cultural heritage. Perhaps it is tied to our notions of what is our right or, or what we own ETC, the need for us to express ourselves in the ways that are dear to us and, and not be assumed by the whole world. And so for me, that, that is something positive. And, and, you know, so we see people trying to reclaim land, reclaim whatever it is. The physical things might be easy to reclaim, but I don't know if we can re reclaim anything like emotional or psychological space. And so we have things like decolonization coming up. So the, the, the globalization is there. 
But within that globe, there are still those individuals, indivi individualities that perhaps enrich that big globe. In, in, in talking about that, we then um, think that maybe sometimes diversity sells, but at other, other times it cripples when we consider different as inferior or when we are afraid of different, then we become self-protective. We cannot reach out. What is the medicine to that? <laughs> Music education. <laughs> Music education of a cultural nature that allows us to understand the person from their cultural space and to recognize that different is not negative, but different is rich. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kuno. Very nice uh, way of um, posing uh, your answer. Very nice. Yes. Um, the last one is just quick. I mean, when I was president, our interest was very much in regional conferences. So the diversity could come more to ISMI in a more organized way and so on. What changes ISMI underwent in the last 10 years on diversity and inclusion? Can you give us uh, an example of action? And, and thank you, Liane. In fact, it's, it's so good talking to you because I think some of the things that you started and those who came slightly before you and after you have perhaps crystallized into very concrete activities. The regional conferences are one, for example. Then there's also a regional representation in governance, especially or particularly as articulated in the policy documents when it comes to selecting the commissioners. We expect the commissioners to, you know, the six, each commission has six commissioners and each commission is encouraged to make sure that it has people from different regions. That is inclusion for me. Um, there is also a different way of looking at inclusion, the membership. ISME as a global uh, organization with membership paid in US dollars can be very expensive. In Kenya, the US dollar is 106 Kenya shillings. And thanks to the, is it the UN or UNESCO, the human HDI, HDI, Human Development Index, okay? So yes. ISME's adoption of that index as a way of um, kind of measuring how much one pays for subscription makes it possible for different people to join. And that is one of the ways of, of enhancing that inclusion, making sure that as many people as possible can come in. Again, moving the World Conference globally, you just mentioned that 2014 were in Brazil and it was beautiful being in Porto Alegre. Moving the, the World Conference globally makes, makes, makes it possible for us to physically be present in a different part of the world every two years. But there is also another move before uh, different associations or different national affiliates would um, bid for the conference. We're now doing it a little differently because what we do is we designate at least after, after some time, we, we designate a conference as a development conference. In short, we are going to a place that we probably had not been to or where ISME presence is not very strong simply to take Isme to that place. That way we find ways of bringing in more people. Liane, you know I can talk until tomorrow. Let me keep quiet. <laughs> We cannot, we cannot. Unfortunately, um, Emily, as I kindly kind, um, name you, thank you so much for being with us uh, today. I mean, it, it was a, a great thing to have you with the Brazilian community and also international community today and my personal pleasure. So my appreciation to have you here. 
thanks. Thanks, Professor Oliveira, again, uh, for being okay. here with us. And Magali, uh, once more, thank you for this seminar. So, thank bye -bye. you very much. Thank you. We thank you, professors, for this powerful and inspiring conference. And if you are watching us and have questions, please write them on the chat. Our team is going to organize and send them to whom it may concern. Continuing the first symposium on musical education, we are going to start the lecture Strengthening the Epistemological Roots of Musical Education with Professor André de Quadros. Please be advised that this lecture will be in Brazilian Portuguese. To mediate it, we invite Professor Marcos Medeiros. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone in the world. And good evening to my friends here in Brazil. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Magali Kleber and her great team for organizing this so important seminar. I am Professor Marcos Medeiros, president of ABEM, the Brazilian Association of Music Education, and it's a great honor being here since ABEM and the International Londrina Music Festival has a long history of partnership. And it's also a great honor for me to present you our guest, Professor André de Quadros. The lecture of this section is Professor André de Quadros, who at the end will have some questions of me. Uh, please welcome Professor de Quadros. Uh, professor André de Quadros is a professor of music at Boston University, where he holds affiliations in African, African American, American and New England, Asian, Jewish, Latin America and Muslim studies and Persian education. He's an ethnomusicologist, music educator, conductor and human rights activist with professional work in the most diverse settings in more than 40 countries, spanning professional ensembles, projects with prisons, psychosocial rehabilitation, refugees, poverty locations, and victims of torture, sexual violence, and trauma. Professor De Quadros, welcome to Brazil and welcome to our seminar. The floor is now yours. Boa tarde, uh, bom dia, boa noite, wherever you happen to be. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting for me to be here because um, eu sou da Goa, uh, India Portuguesa, and, and so my name, André Francisco de Quadros, is actually uh, a name that is given to me by the Portuguese. So here my, my original Indian family name is taken away and substituted by, by Portuguese names. So I am a walking advertisement for coloniality. And so we, I'd like to speak today about this issue of coloniality and colonization and epistemology and culture. So many of these um, different uh, aspects that are together. And I'm going to start off with a short, just a short example of a video, because we have so much talking, but not enough, uh, in my view, perhaps uh, a little bit of music will help us to bring ourselves closer to some ideas that we are talking about here. So um, I'm just going to, I hope you can see and hear okay with this, um, um, just uh, let's see that um, I have the capacity to share screen. I think I do. So here it is. Um. Para mí en especial es una una experiencia muy bonita porque desglosar de una palabrita tan sencilla desglosar una canción e eh, armar un rompecabezas en mi mente una palabra ah una simple palabra salud amor 
paz, tormenta. Pero de esa palabra podemos desglosar muchas cosas. We were asked to come up with a question if other So I wanted to start, of, of course, with uh, showing you a, a video because I think the video is, uh, is very, very important uh, to, uh, to bring you close to, to the kind, kinds of things that we are talking about here today. And I'm going to continue now with a PowerPoint presentation, which, which, is, uh, which uh, highlights the kinds of issues that we want to uh, talk about. Uh, so the, the, what you just watched on, on, the, um, on the video is an encuentro uh, that, that the uh, uh, organization I uh, co-direct called Common Ground Voices La Frontera is, is in Tijuana working with refugees. And this particular video was taken at a workshop that we gave with refugees who are lesbian and gay and transgender, but these are mostly all transgender refugees. So here is um, is uh, some of the some of the the slides I want to show you because I think if we're talking about visible voice. Here are some of the ideas about visible voice. This is the um, this is where we are. Common ground voices, the the the, the choir at the border wall this on one side you you have the united states and on the other side you have mexico and you can see my hand my finger going through the wall um, and this is also um, a, a performance of an example where we talk about uh, the dispossession of women uh, women's voices refugee voices in the context of of performance itself. So uh, in the, you know, we have this idea to talk about strengthening the epistemological roots. And I want to start off by talking about strengthening and weakening. Because unless we talk about uh, both, then we are not, then we, then we are really not inhabiting the, the question enough. So we have to understand, of course, like, I, like I'm talking to you now, I said at the beginning, that I am an example of coloniality. I do not want the colonial roots to be strengthened. The colonial roots have to be weakened. So we have systems of oppression uh, that Paulo Freire talks about uh, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And he talks about this. And the idea is we have systems and structures. And the systems and structures exist to perpetuate and to strengthen. We have to work towards weakening certain roots and we have to work to strengthen certain roots. So just like, like, like Alda said, like Magali, like uh, Sandra, like Emily and, um, and uh, Liani, uh, they say, we're all saying we need to think differently. We need to make more visible. We need to change, change the, the paradigms uh, of work that we are um, we're doing here. So, um, and in, in order for us to talk about strengthening and weakening, uh, I will make this um, a, a focus on my next question. Let's talk about epistemology and let's talk about culture. Now, there are two, 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 two things here. Epistemology is essentially about knowledge. It's about way of knowing, a way of seeing the world, the way of understanding the world around us. Epistemology is simply essentially a a way of knowing. The ways of knowing that we have are ways of knowing that have been informed by music and music education, political acts, narratives that we get, get given that are persistent, that seek to support and perpetuate existing, existing structures of oppression. And so we have to interrogate these what are these ways of knowing? And some of these ways of knowing 
might help us to think differently and some of them essentially inhibit our, our ability to imagine and to, and to conceptualize a different paradigm of music education. The second is to talk about culture. And we have to think about culture in many different ways. Very often, people talk about culture as the demographic. Culture as he comes from there, they, go, they come from this place, this person is from that place, this person of this color, and so on. But the idea that culture is many faceted, as Bakhtin, Mikhail Bakhtin talks about, the concept of the figured world, that every individual belongs in a unique constellation. And the, that constellation is informed partly by race, partly by issues of poverty, partly by by gender identity, uh, partly by, by uh, uh, place of origin, by religion, by, by political and worldviews and so forth, that culture is not in the sense of the flat concept of, of multiple identities, but culture is a, is a much uh, larger and deeper understanding in terms of this idea of the figured world. And therefore, we come to talking about this idea of the world. And I want to, want to talk about forgotten, silenced, and invisible. Because when, when um, I, I, I love the way uh, Sandra and, and Emily talked about making the visible, um, making, making the vis in, in other words, a visible voice, but in other words, to make uh, what has been invisible. But it's not just making, making it invisible, but actually making it sound because it has been silenced. They are forgotten very often. So we have to be this idea of memory. I was working, uh, I've been working in prisons for many years. And, uh, and then I, uh, uh, when I went to a prison in Bangkok and I was um, talking to one of the women in the prison and she said, we are treated like society's trash, society's garbage. And it was a very profound statement for me that, that, that our profession, music and music education has forgotten, has forgotten to serve the common good, has forgotten to serve the good of people who we dispose of, who society disposes of as garbage. So, who do we exclude? We have to ask ourselves these questions. In our music and music education, it's the, I, if we always frame questions in the affirmative, then we don't get to the heart of these questions. Who do we exclude, not who do we include? Whose music is not represented? When I say whose music is not represented, it's like, and music is multifaceted, and even talking about what constitutes music is really important too. Um, who is not making music at all. And if we think about music as an access to music, in, according to Article 27 of the United Nations Declaration for Human Rights, who is not making music, I mean, the idea that access to music is an essential and basic human right is something we need to think about. And right doesn't necessarily mean, well, yes, they have a right of access, but some people have a disproportionate access, which in fact means that we have a hierarchy of access, which then doesn't serve the rights of everybody. There's no access to music making. Uh, and uh, this is important for us to talk about because when is music an act of violence? Because very often we, you know, in our conversations, we talk about music is good, music is is uh, uh, it gives us agency and so forth. But we have to understand the music when it perpetuates systems of oppression, when it when it reinforces uh, systems of of class and cultural superiority, then they when the superiority and the elitism is reinforced, music is as Foucault talks about as Bourdieu talks about, it becomes symbolic and structural violence. Uh, and uh, the, the last question I have in this sequence is how have we created a hierarchy and a fetish that sounding good is better than being good? I think you have all heard these examples. People say, oh, that's a good orchestra. But what do we mean when we say that's a good orchestra? We actually mean that it sounds good. I mean, there's a difference between 
sounding good and being good. What does goodness actually mean? What are, what are the values of goodness that should inhabit music and music education? So if goodness implies fundamental human values, we have to understand that you can actually sound good and be bad, right? So I, I, I give the example very often of, I, I, uh, and you know, we, we have, an, a, a, for example, here in the United States, numerous examples of, of conductors and musicians who sound very good, but they have been responsible for sexual abuse. And so we say they are, this, here's a good conductor, here's a very good pianist, but we, but we actually mean that they're only sounding good. And we have to be able to say, we have to redefine, reimagine the concepts of excellence because we ourselves perpetuate these concepts of excellence. And then what are we doing? We are bringing these epistemologies, these ways of knowing, these ways of seeing and understanding into, into our work. Um, uh, I'm going to finish now with, uh, with, with this, because I really am more interested in the conversation with, uh, with uh, uh, Marcus Medeiros. Uh, and he says, uh, this is coloniality survives colonialism. In fact, we have to understand this, right? Is it maintained alive in books? the criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, in common sense, like even the way we think, we think in the self image of peoples, in aspirations, in so many other, other aspects of our modern experience. In a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality all the time and every day. I'd like to stop there because I really am very interested in our, um, our discussion because I, I read uh, Marcus Medeiros' uh, paper, uh, um, and I was uh, uh, I have a lot of questions about his questions. So uh, now I'm very happy to turn over back to him to discuss epistemology, discuss culture, and not to talk not only just about strengthening the the roots, but also weakening the roots. I want to talk about how we might weaken the roots rather than just strengthen the roots of epistemology. Thank you, Professor Andre. Uh, it was really inspiring your your talk. Um, so, as I have sent to you, I, I have some questions for our discussion. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself to those who who are here with us. Uh, as I said to you in the beginning. I am uh, the president of Brazilian Association for Music Education. Uh, and I'm also an associate professor of music education at the Federal University of Juiz de Fora in Brazil. I'm also a pianist, music educator, and my research interests are about sociology of music education, scholar music education, curriculum, and musical knowledge practices. So, since we are discussing this so important and so interesting topic, strengthening and, as you brilliantly said, weakening some epistemological roles in music education, I, I have a first question because uh, some people, some musicians, uh, some teachers can be frightened uh, with this, all these things related to decolonization. Uh, some of them uh, are afraid of losing their privileges, uh, the places that they built uh, in the world, uh, in the musical practices that we have. And one of their critics to decolonization is about relat relativism. So how do you think we can escape relativism in face of this poignant need to decolonize epistemologies in music and music education? You know, uh, this is a wonderful question uh, because the reality is that we are all in systems. We are all in systems and these systems uh, give us some power. And one of the things to recognize is really important thing to understand is the question of power and and privilege like you talk about so for example if you look at uh, at this uh, um, slide here where i say 
what does coloniality mean? I mean, we have to understand what it means. So, and if you look at Frere, uh, Paulo Frere, and you know, in in his work, he, uh, he talks about how we are all caught up in the system, and we have to understand our place in the system. Fanon talks about this in his uh, fantastic book from the 1960s, and we have. We, in order to understand Frere, we have to understand uh, where it came from, that he was very much influenced by Franz Fanon. But the uh, understanding who has power, where where does the power lie? How much power do I have? Uh, what can I do? What risks can I take? Yes, your question is fantastic, Marcus, because this is a question of relativism. How are we and how do we see ourselves within this fabric? I am a professor at a university. I have, some people think I have a lot of power, but you know, uh, when we actually look at it very carefully, how much power I have and how much power I don't have. And I think sometimes about people who teach in schools. If you, have, if you teach in schools, you have a job to, to protect. You have a family to feed. You have, you have expectations that are placed upon you. You may have and it's all very well for Andre the Quadras to say, yes, decol decolonize your practice. But if you have a responsibility and if you have responsibilities and a job to, to do, you have to understand, you have to start off by understanding what is coloniality and where is the power? Because, because if you don't understand that, then you don't, then you, then you, then you are, then you are thinking about this notions of idealism. And I think that your question is very good because it brings us brings relativism together with, with uh, idealism. But the, the last point I'm going to make about this is this notion of utopia. And in, in every, uh, uh, Paulo Freire talks about this, about utopia, about the, we have to have a sense of where the journey is taking us to. Uh, because that's a, a very important, then every act that we, that we, that we commit to every step that we take has to be somehow in sight of looking at a longer vision. We may not be able to act on every single vision, but it is as important to, it's important to understand where the dream is, where the dream can take us. Uh, fantastic professor and it's really so interesting uh, because I, I have an example of my own. When I wrote about this, I first used uh, Pierre Bourdieu and I used the notion of habitus uh, of Pierre Bourdieu and I'm a Brazilian man and I, although I knew Paulo Freire, I didn't use uh, Paulo Freire on these my early texts. So it's an, uh, I am an example of uh, the need of decolonization of thought. And in talking uh, about this, I'm not saying that I will give up of Pierre Bourdieu, but I need to, to express to the world uh, the power of Brazilian intellectuals as the great power of Paulo Freire that you bring uh, here today as uh, a great teacher in Brazil. So now I, I have just uh, one more question for you. Uh, that what are the possible paths for research in music education and also for practices in music education, aiming at effective changes in the view of the coloniality of thought. And linked to this, what are the strengths and the limits of the colonial thinking, in your opinion? Uh, well, you have asked uh, probably 50 questions in, in, in one, in, you know, when you unpack these, there are so many <laughs> different questions. I don't, I don't want to talk for too long, but I want to start off by talking about Paulo Freire's border crossing. And Paulo Freire talks about this. It's really important, the idea of crossing borders. And border crossing is about tran 
transcending epistemological boundaries, uh, uh, transcending geographies. And if we think, you know, really in, in Freudian concepts of, of being a border crosser, what I would say is if we think about all your question, uh, Marcus, in the context of border crosser, uh, then, I mean, frontera, la frontera. I mean, I, I don't, I, my, my, now at the moment, my Portuguese is mixed with my Spanish because I use Spanish more than Portuguese, so I'm sorry about that. But the idea, and in, in, you know, in other words, la frontera, la frontera is not only the place of a geography, but la frontera is the, 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 the boundaries that we create, right, between, between research and practice, the boundary between, between music and dance, the boundary between this and that, the boundary between this place and that place, um, the boundary between a teacher and student. And um, these are power differentials that are boundaries and borders. And what Paulo Freire in, in, in his work and his work about dialogue and so on, and he talks about this idea of, of going through these borders. And I would say uh, to talk about two things. One is if you're in terms of practice, number one, we have to go right away immediately as much as possible to places of people who have been silenced, forgotten, and invisible. They are people who have access and they have a right to music. We don't go there to bring music to them because, because we are not there and we don't have these hierarchies. We go there to listen, to share, to walk alongside them, to make music with them. So I think that's really important. This, so really, I would say in a practical sense, it's very easy, actually, if you go there, go into these spaces with humility, we have a different idea of what practice might mean. In terms of research, I don't think that we are understanding enough the, the capacity of music uh, and music education to be, to be a place of, of personal expression, personal power, boundary crossing in the in the way that that Freire talks about in a disciplinary way. So I think we need examples, we need case studies, we need uh, uh, sociology informed work. I, I, I'm very much I mentioned Bourdieu, because I, I uh, earlier when I talked about symbolic violence and so on, because I really think it's, uh, I think we have to we have to bring sociology into the way we think about research. You talked about many other questions in there. But I, I really one day, Marcus, we will have coffee together and then we can talk for hours. But I know that we are already over time. So I thank you for your questions. I, I, I really want to say that you're doing fantastic work, Marcus. And, and, uh, and I read your article, it's really excellent. And, uh, and also while I'm here to, to thank uh, Magali and, um, and Sandra and everybody, uh, and, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm Andre Kualush. I'm really like, I feel as if I'm, I could be, when I'm in a taxi in, in Boston, they say Andre Kualush and I say, then they're Brazilian and they say, you saw, you must be Brazilian. I say, no, I'm not Brazilian, but maybe I can be an honorary Brazilian. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Andre. It, it was really inspiring and it was really great to hear from you. Uh, we hope that things in all the world and here in Brazil go better so you can visit us and you can talk to us uh, in person and we we can we could have so our coffee and talk a lot about decolonization uh, and about music education and and music thank you very much my great appreciation to have you here uh, it was a great pleasure meeting you, reading your work, and I'm sure that Brazil is always open to you, to your visit, and to your contributions to, to music and to music education and to humankind, uh, trying to be good and not trying just to sound good, as you said. So thank you, really thank you very much. I'd like to thank also, Dr. Magali Kleber for this opportunity to meeting uh, so great people, so great teachers for, for, from all around the world. And let's continue 
our first symposium. Uh, thank you all for, for the attention. Have a, a good night, have a good morning, have a good afternoon. Thank you all. We deeply appreciate all these brilliant contributions. Thanks, professors. And I remember our audience that questions must be please written on the chat. Our team is going to organize and send them to whom it may concern. Our next conference is Teaching Traditional Music in Modern Society, Cantonese Opera in Hong Kong as an example with Professor Bu Wa Lung. This conference will be moderated by Professor Sandra Oberoi. Thank you. I'm sure everybody's having um, an enlightening time, a stimulating session really with um, all our speakers so far. We want to welcome Professor Boa Lung from, um, well, he's joining us today from Hong Kong and it's 5 a.m. in the morning. Thank you so much for making time to do this at an at a interesting hour. It is really my honor and delight to introduce him to you all today. He is the professor of the Department of Cultural and Creative Arts and the director of, research of the Research Center for Transmission of Cantonese Opera at the Education University of Hong Kong. His research work on incorporating Cantonese opera into the formal music curriculum in schools has earned him numerous awards. Professor Boa is highly published. His articles and books have been widely cited and his work is well respected. He has also served on multiple committees around the world. Today, he joins us in both his capacity as Ismay's president-elect, as well as the chair of the Council of Professional Associations. And he will share pearls of wisdom today as he talks about teaching traditional music in the modern society, Cantonese opera in Hong Kong, as an example. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandra. Uh, it's my honor to participate and, and share with you my, my work and my views on uh, teaching traditional music. So, um, and of course, thanks to all the organization and it's, it's really wonderful to, to, to be here in kind of Brazil. Okay, now let me share my screen uh, for my PowerPoint. Okay. Now, um, I got 20 minutes, I know, so um, I try to get it done within 20 minutes, okay? Now, um, just let me give you a, <clears throat> a background. And this is the, the, the framework of my presentation. First, I will talk about the current situation in Hong Kong and why teaching traditional music. I, I think this can be, uh, is, is a common, common uh, issue uh, with Brazil and other countries in the world. So what to teach, how to teach, or for whom to teach, and where and when to teach. These are uh, always my issues and my, my interest for research. So, and finally, our future challenges. I think these challenges are also very common in the world. Okay. So our current situation about Cantonese opera, first of all, Cantonese opera is enlisted in the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage in 2009. Now this is, this is a big news for Hong Kong, uh, especially in, in, in the field of arts. So um, because this is the only art form and, and only thing that enlisted in the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage. So uh, this is, and Cantonese Opera is a representative traditional art form for promoting cultural and national identity and about decolonization. Um, as you know, Hong Kong was a British colon colony uh, since 1997. After that, we have uh, been returned to China. So, um, and in recent decades, Hong Kong government has promoted and helped preserving the genre. For example, we have done, um, we have included 
the Cantonese Opera in the school official curriculum since 2003. Uh, but uh, it, it is not a really, really mandatory uh, item in, in the curriculum. So teachers were just encouraged to teach. And we, we already know that it, it would be very difficult for teachers to teach because they don't have that kind of uh, background and knowledge. Uh, there are many other things like founded Cantonese Opera Development Fund in 2005 to promote uh, community performances, etc. And we had a new C2 Center, which was opened in 2019. Now, this is a very beautiful and modern theater. So so-called C2 is mean, means Chinese traditional theater. This theater is um, well designed and only for Chinese traditional theater, for example, Cantonese opera. So it's now a very common place uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, <clears throat> I had a recent survey in 2021, this year in Hong Kong, about the extent to which schools and teachers are really teaching Cantonese opera in Hong Kong. There were 300, more than 300 and 200 uh, primary and secondary schools participated, and we found that um, more than 80% of primary and 60% of secondary schools are teaching Cantonese opera, which sounds good, but however, the teaching time is very limited, Not no, no more than 10% or even 6% in, in secondary schools. Primary school, a little bit better, 10%. Now, it reflects some complicated situation, is that um, it seems that um, the teachers know that we should do it. We should teach the traditional culture, but they really found the difficulty. So they don't allocate too much time on this kind of musical uh, art form, okay, in, in their teaching. So, and still Western art music is dom still dominating the cur school curriculum and the musical training, musical preferences are the reasons, okay? Still, because we, we still have the teachers who are, who like, Western art and Western pop music, rather than Chinese cultural music. <clears throat> so we have some implications, including intervention from the government with a clear educational policy is needed. But up to this moment, it is not really clear from the government uh, doing such kind of intervention. <clears throat> and to make a balance between traditional music and Western music, this is my, I think this is, is, a, is an issue we have to pursue in the future. So a balance between traditional music and Western art music, or maybe other music, okay? And I always <clears throat> advocate that <clears throat> in the modern time, uh, we should pursue a so-called bi-musicality in students. That means um, just like a bilingual uh, <clears throat> capability in, in the modern time, we know, of course, we know our mother tongue, and of course, we have to know some kind of international language in order to promote our teaching learning and then our international participation. Maybe English is the international language that everyone has to learn. This is the current situation. So in terms of music, um, the mother tongue music, music or the local music is our uh, artistic mother tongue should be learned. And, and of course, maybe Western music is another international musical language, which should also be learned. <clears throat> so why teaching traditional music? So <clears throat> uh, I think it's incredible is to transmit and to preserve our local culture. Okay, so it, it, of course, this is another reason for decolonization. Okay, uh, Hong Kong has been uh, very westernized in, to a certain extent, of course, uh, but we almost we sometimes have lost or re couldn't remember our local and uh, culture related to China. So um, we have to also sustain the traditional culture and art forms. So we have to nurture our audiences for sustainability of tra traditional art forms. Actually, we are facing a threat to how to sustain the local culture, including Cantonese opera, okay? And how to enhance our younger generations to understand and develop that cultural and national identity is another issue. Um, so um, actually, Hong Kong people has a kind of hybrid cultural um, identity. That means on, on, one, on the one hand, we are rather Western, 
westernized okay but on the other hand we we have that kind of chinese cultural thinking or beliefs so what to teach now <clears throat> i think um important thing is how to how the genre how the cantus opera or other chinese musical arts is different from western art music this is a very good point and in in into the curriculum so uh, for example how uh, our, our oral approach is critical in Cantonese opera. We do not rely too much on notation in terms of teaching and learning. Okay, so this is one aspect. Uh, other as specific aesthetics of Cantonese opera, like musical system, okay, uh, play and sing by ear. Okay, notation is just for recording. Again, melody is derived from linguistic tones of Cantonese. Cantonese melodic tones have to match the, with linguistic tones. I have to explain to you that, um, for example, Cantonese, our our dialect in, in Hong Kong and, and Guangdong province, uh, this is a so-called tonal language. Actually, many Asian languages are tonal languages. Okay, We have different tones with, within the same word. If you pronounce in different tones, it can be understood as another word. Now I can I can give you a, an example. For example, my name. Okay, Sandra called me Boa, and this is a national English pronunciation. Okay, but when you when you say in Bo, actually it's not really correct because my my Kenneth's name should be Bo. Okay, so when you say Bo, that can be uh, can meaning another word. Okay, and my name should be Bo Wa. My name Wa is a low tone, is the lowest. Okay. So if you say Wa, Wa is another word. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now this is an example. Okay. So when we sing using Cantonese, that kind of dialect, we means we have to match the melodic tones with the linguistic tones. Otherwise, the whole uh, meaning, the meaning of the of the language will be uh, misunderstood easily. Okay, so this is very important thing. Okay, and when we teach about this thing to the students, uh, this is really critical because they, of course, we we prefer and uh, communicating in 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 Cantonese, our mother tongue, which is more more easy for for the younger people. Okay, and they would like to preserve the the Cantonese culture, and. <clears throat> And because of the lang language problem or issue, the singing skills is important. We have to emphasize on the cl clarity of diction. Okay, we have to move to 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 really push our um, uh, mouth position in in a very clear way, so that the words are really <laughs> really communicated really clearly. And the performance context, uh, the original context, is for ritual ceremonies or maybe festivals or celebrations of those deities' birthday. These are all the traditional cultural uh, events of Chinese people in, in the uh, rural area. So the main function was the ritual functions originally, but the, in the modern context, it is influenced by the Western culture. We, uh, we have to change to the modern theaters. It, it's for artistic purposes. Now, this is a, a kind of dilemma, kind of, okay? So um, we have to introduce the con original context to the students and to also they, they will re receive the, a modern context. So non-musical outcomes could, could be developing Chinese culture and beliefs. Now, there are so many things that we have to teach through Cantonese opera, like Chinese history, Chinese arts, okay? Because in the theater, in the, in the, uh, theater we have to learn music, dance, visual arts, about their makeup and their costumes, and about literature and, and drama, of course, and some moral thoughts like loyalty, filial piety, benevolence, righteousness, and our Chinese philosophy. These are to be taught through the Cantonese opera. And developing cultural competency is another issue that we need to, to learn and to promote. Okay, so in, in modern time, awareness of our culture and attitude towards cultural differences knowledge of different cultural practices and worldviews and cross-cultural skills. I believe that these should be taught in the in through any kinds of world music, especially the mother tongue in terms of mu uh, music like Cantonese Opera in Hong Kong. So um, our performing contest, as I mentioned, is a mobile performance. This is a, some kind of temporary uh, uh, bamboo made by bamboo and tin sheets. 
Okay, this kind of theater can be moved and to, to be mobilized. Okay, it, the audience normally is quite far from the stage. They can be very noisy and is a kind of informal setting and uncontrollable audience behavior. In the traditional practice, the audience can do anything when during the performance, like they can eat and drink, they can play, they can do some gambling, okay, they can talk, and the, all those children will play around. So it's a very informal uh, setting. <clears throat> and the beliefs, uh, uh, normally we, should, we believe that they should possess educational values, okay, happy endings, positive. Okay, bad guys must receive punishments. <laughs> okay, and social cultural context is, is for uneducated audience. So the, the story should be simple and should be educational. Aesthetics about, for example, makeup. This is always the point that the students like or dislike, okay? Because they think that this is not really real or in, in, re in reality, it, it's, it's, it's rare to see that kind of makeup. But we have to exaggerate because first of all, it's quite far away from the audience. And second, it's a kind of beautification because many of the old, uh, uh, artists are quite old. They have to learn long, long time. So when they become a very famous artist, they are, they are already not too young. So this is the reason that have two of them make a very good uh, makeup to beautify. And also a kind of identification. Now in our practice, the red face means it's a good guy, okay? And the white face is a bad guy. So this is, is easy for the audience to understand the, the character of the, uh, of, of the roles, okay? So this provides a, a context, context, contextualization that we have to know the Chinese culture, okay? Falsetto voice is another issue, mainly for female. We have, they sing in a very high uh, a voice because they have to penetrate in a noisy context. So this, all the uh, musical and artistic presentation is closely related to the context, uh, to the performing events. So how to teach? Now, all these are the learning. So I have do some, I've done some research, for example, for professional artists, um, I've done about their informal and informal learning um, because all the professional artists are doing uh, so-called apprenticeship. That means um, they don't have any formal learning, some kind in the, in the past, but nowadays we have to rely on the, con, uh, the academy and the university to teach, to train the professional artist. And recently I, I, I had another res a research on personal style because in recent development, I found that uh, personal style has not been valued too much. Okay, so, and, all, and all the audiences do not find personal style. So, um, and we found that artists and audience from the current environment is difficult for personal style development. Okay, for school education. Now, um, collaborating with community artists is a very effective solution to help with the situation and applying modern technology, for example, VR, virtual reality is in another way. <clears throat> and, but still teachers is the most important point. They, their demonstration in singing and you know everything is crucial in order to motivate the students to learn. For whom to teach? Well, for, of course, for teachers, teacher education program is the first point. Okay, so we have to teach in the teacher education program so that to make sure the teachers will do it in class. For children, uh, is for the purpose of audience building. In the in the future, if we do not teach in schools, how can we have the future audience? For youngsters, because we have to nurture potential professional artists. And for general audiences, providing learning opportunities in the community, because we believe that if the audience level is higher, is an, uh, enlisted or, or uplifted, uh, the artists will perform even better because in order to satisfy those high requirement uh, uh, or the high expectation audiences. When and where? Okay. Now schools for popularization is common and important. So I, I always think that compulsory element in the official and school curriculum is important start as early as possible is included just like western art music <clears throat> okay in originally for example in, in in 1980s when i was still in the secondary school uh, at that time we didn't know too much about classical music okay but at that time the hong kong government pushed the classical music in schools and it found we found that it's very effective nowadays 
almost every school has their orchestra or at least choir or band in or in Western art music, of course. So it's it's very it, it has been proved that uh, teaching in schools for compulsory education is really important and effective. In the community, we have to encourage artists to op- offer self-finance programs in the community. So there are some artists who do not really do a professional life for performance, but to teach in a community setting. So, and also this is a good place for preparation of potential professional artists. And some students undertake the program as their hobby, but before that they have to encounter with the art form in school so that they can really um, to be interested. And finally, institution for professional training that I always advocate that there is there should be a balance between informal and formal learning. Uh, in the curriculum, there should be, of course, formal learning. But and on the other hand, um, we we know that from the apprenticeship, we had met much benefits from informal learning. For example, the close relationship between the students and the teacher. This is more than a teacher-student relationship, but a kind of master and apprentice. Uh, relationship, just like a father and son relationship. Okay, they're, they're so close and they understand it. And those master has com- uh, communicated every day with the students. Okay, so uh, internship is important, and teachers are practicing artists. So we encourage those teachers in the academy should be also professional artists in the field. Um, they can groom the students. They can perform the students on the stage uh, simultaneously. So of course, we need graduate school to nurture academic or teachers and researchers for, for those art form. Our future challenges, it will remain for forever, I think. Okay. Now, audience building or audience development is always the first point. How to per- persuade young people to become audiences. Um, as I said, um, putting the, the art form in the school curriculum is the first step. And all the teachers have to really teach the genre is an, another one. Transmission, how to encourage young people to join the profession. Now, this is another challenge because it, it seems there are many parents they, thinking that um, doing that kind of profession is not really reliable for their for their life. You know, um, it is not not very uh, not a very secure way, other than other professions like um, doing a doctor or teachers or anything. Okay, but being an artist like Western art music, the same situation. Now, school education, how to motivate stu- school children to learn the genre is another issue. So music teachers have a very heavy responsibility for that. Finally, government policy, how to preserve the tradition. Um, Hong Kong government has done a lot, as I said before, okay. Um, but I think they still have to understand really um, and communicate with the academics and the schools and to know their difficulties and how to help them, okay. So um, my research have help a lot and I think my research center has provided some kind of information so that they can make a good policy for that. I know time is always up, almost up. Okay, these are my uh, references. Okay, so um, thank you for your listening and I uh, questions are welcome. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Professor Bo Wa. I hope I got it right now. <laughs> yeah, um, I I had no idea that I was mispronouncing your name. Please pardon my um, fallacy in that sense, but I shall make an attempt to never make that mistake again. But thank you so much for your uh, very inspiring presentation. I think um, I'm going to ask a few questions on behalf of everyone because the idea here is that this presentation that you've brought to us today could give our um, attendees, music educators, researchers, students, some 
ideas on how they can perhaps go ahead with developing new thought processes for Brazil's music education landscape. So my first question to you would be, I know you've explained this in some sense, saying that the Hong Kong government has been quite supportive of the arts in some ways. But I want to ask you if you can outline some of the challenges you faced um, as you pushed for the implementation of, uh, you know, this unique curriculum, because what you're doing is unique teaching Cantonese opera in schools. Maybe you can elaborate on uh, what was the response you received from schools and how you were able to ensure that the curriculum was implemented. Mm. Uh, thank you for these questions. Um, but yes, of course, there are many, many challenges. Now, I think the first point is um, the teachers. Uh, you know, um, there are around 1,200 schools and around 5,000 music teachers in Hong Kong. So um, it's so hard to to ask all the music teachers to teach um, the, the, the journey school in school. OK, and the main, most critical point is that they most of them are um, they like Western art music. They, everybody, you know, learn the piano and the Western instrument, maybe the violin, then they become a teacher. Okay. And when they go to school, you can imagine they, they would just teach Western classical music. And sometimes they may teach a bit pop music, but it's still Western pop music. Um, recently, we, we may taught some can, canto pop, but um, canto pop is not so popular now. <laughs> it's changing, you know, so rapidly. So, um, it is always difficult to ask the music teachers to really teach it. So the point is that we have to really do the in-surface teaching program so that uh, to 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 help them to learn. First of all, they have to really learn. Just like I think they, they are just like learning a new instrument to sing Cantonese opera is a kind of new instrument. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second thing is the, about the pedagogy and the learning mode and approaches. Now. Everybody knows that in Western art music, we have to rely on notation, Western notation. OK, we have to read when they when we play and sing. OK, but in, in those tra traditional art music, we have to learn to play and sing by ear. That means we don't rely too much on notation. OK, so this is this is another way. I found that when I actually my personally, I, ha I have also learned how to sing Cantonese opera and, and accompaniment. OK, and this is my first difficulty. I remember around 10 years ago. OK, so um, we have to change the whole thing. And this is very similar to jazz, I think, jazz music. OK, we don't have any pro, uh, notation. Actually, we, we got some notation, but um, not really accurately recorded. OK, so we have to rely on listening, listening to ourselves and listening to others and to make the accompaniment. OK, so um, so. Now, uh, recently, I, I'm, I'm uh, actually I've been doing several things. Um, the first thing important is the so-called I did a coll uh, collaboration project on artists and teachers. That means I invited some community artists to collaborate with school music teacher. They um, they just joined together in the classroom. So there are two teachers. One is the classroom music teacher, and, uh, and the other one is the artist. So. They, they are just compensate on each other. You know, the music teachers will just manage the classroom and to introduce to the students. But uh, the uh, community artists will just uh, demonstrate and talk about their, their art and to, to do some coaching. So I found this a very useful and useful way, okay, to do it. But the problem is if you don't have the, the funding to support that kind of collaboration, OK, for example, if the school has no fund for to hire the artist, then it will just stop. And, and so the most important point is the teacher development. That means through this collaboration, I hope and I, I try to to push those music teachers to learn with the artists so that in maybe three years time, then they, they can teach the genre by themselves rather than relying on the artist. OK, so um, still it is up to this moment is still difficult. I think it is common in the world. OK, so another issue is um, the government has pushed to to put the Cantonese opera in a so-called public examination. 
Okay, now we in Hong Kong, we have a public examination for those high school graduates when they have to enter into the university. So we have an exam called Hong Kong DSE, Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education Examination. Now every high school graduates have to take part in this exam so that they can be enrolled into university. In, in that exam, uh, there are four subjects, course, core papers, Chinese, English, math, and general studies. So apart from these four, they, they, they can select two to three electives. And music is one of the electives, okay? So in the music paper, there are 6% are, uh, is contr contributed to Cantonese opera. It's compulsory, okay? So if those students would like to take music as an elective, they have to learn a little about Cantonese opera. So nowadays it's more common uh, to, to find that some music teachers are really doing uh, to teach that genre. This is another strategy, I would say, to promote a kind of specific art form in the school curriculum. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that you say this because you've actually answered a part of uh, the other question that I was going to ask you on how um, teacher training happens at schools to equip teachers, because I can quite imagine that it must be very difficult. You said 10 years ago, it was so difficult for you to, you had to learn it yourself, Cantonese opera, and uh, to be able to teach it or even understand it for that matter. And I, I suppose even for teachers, they might find it um, rather perhaps you know they may be scared whether they are authentic or not or um, worried about uh, not earlier professor andre de quadro said you know you are supposed to teach a bunch of certain things that's already laid out now if you go away deviate from that then what happens right so it's very interesting that you say this and i'm reminded of our colleague in ireland um dr um gwen moore who also said that uh in the celtic uh context they have specialists coming in because teachers don't know whether what they're doing is the right thing so it's nice that um hong kong is promoting all of these things and it's really nice that you are creating spaces for um training programs for teachers to in the span of three years understand and be able to be independent teachers and really congratulations to you for writing books that are implemented in the curriculum that is a huge feat and i commend you on that professor boa thank you um uh, thank you, everybody. With this, we've actually come to the close of our session. And I am just going to say, I think we, we can all agree here today that we have had a very interesting and meaningful time. Wouldn't you agree with me? I know I can't see your faces, but I'm believing that you're all nodding in agreement with me. Um, and I think I'm sure we've all been challenged to ask different questions to to think with new angles, what music education is, why it is important, looking at music literacy as being an important facet of arts literacy because it promotes cultural intelligence and a social agency. We've started to think about when music can be harmful. That was a very interesting point raised by one of our speakers today, uh, Dr. De Quadros. And then we um, spoke about reaching out to people who have been silent silenced, forgotten and invisible to make music with them. I love that to make music with them. Um, I think we uh, can look forward to a wonderful day tomorrow as well. And as a reminder, we invite you to share your thoughts, have an honest and open dialogue. In other words, to please, as I said earlier, right at the opening, you bring these pieces of the puzzle together with the words and with the ideas and with the questions you ask so make put the pieces together of this grand puzzle together with us the finished work which we will be sharing with all of you um and hopefully making the changes in music education in brazil so see you tomorrow for another invigorating day of discussions with our fabulous speakers who come from various backgrounds in music education and who will further stimulate very valuable conversations here at this symposium. I'm Sandra Oberoi, 
and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you to our amazing, amazing symposium team. And thank you once again to all our speakers. Have a very good evening. God bless you all.